You're listening to a podcast by Lance Lambert Ministries. For more information on this ministry, visit lancelambert.org or follow us on social media to receive all of our updates. In this episode, Lance returns to Halford House from Israel and teaches some of the history of Israel and Israel's current events at that time. He shows how Israel is the fig tree, the marker that shows where we are in God's perspective of world history. Let's listen to God's Time Clock. sing to the Lord. We have to learn it a little bit. Yeah. The thing that he is the Lord of glory, the great thing, of course, for Jewish believers here is the king of the Jews. Yeah. But for us in the nations, we know he's the king of all kings. All the kings, all the rulers in the nations, the Lord Jesus is the king of all kings. And uh, what a marvelous thing that is. You are the son of righteousness with healing in your wings. Let's sing it to the Lord. We'll sing it in English, and then we'll sing it in Hebrew, and then we'll sing it in English. But uh, but the main thing is just to really sing it as a praise to you. And let's, let's meet as we sing it to him. I think it'd be good if we stood and, and sang it. And um, sing it to the Lord Jesus. But this is who he is. To us, to the Father, to all in the nations, and those heavenly beings. just like to say to everybody thank you very much all those of you who have uh, prayed um, for me and of course also I'm sure I speak on behalf of Achim and Tressel and Sophia uh, for your prayers and also the practical uh, uh, fellowship that you have from time to time extended to us thank you very very much I'm sorry that uh, the last time we ditched you um, and didn't get here, but uh, um, I'm glad this time we've made it. I'd like to read to you in the Gospel of Luke and chapter 21. I will read from verse 20. But when ye see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that her desolation is at hand. Then let them that are in Judea flee unto the mountains, and let them that are in the midst of her depart out, and let not them that are in the country enter therein. For these are days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress upon the land and wrath, unto this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in sun and moon and stars and upon the earth distress of nations in perplexity for the roaring of the sea 
and the billows, men fainting for fear and for expectation of the things which are coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see it, and know of your own selves that the summer is now nigh. Even so ye also, when ye see these things coming to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all things be accomplished. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest haply your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come on you suddenly as a snare, for so shall it come upon all them that dwell in the face of all the earth. But watch ye at every season, making supplication that ye may prevail to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, I was asked if this evening I would say something about Israel, and particularly perhaps something in a way elementary and um, uh, fundamental to the whole matter. I don't think I need to say to any of you this evening uh, here that this whole question of Israel is um, a violently controversial subject uh, amongst Christians. There are those Christians who hopefully and uh, vehemently, uh, dogmatically uh, state uh, that um, the recreation of the Jewish state um, of Israel um, it has nothing whatsoever to do with the word of God, nothing whatsoever to do with the program of God. They have gone so far as to call it a political accident. It is in the sense that any emerging nation is under the sovereignty of God, Israel is under the sovereignty of God, and her emergence is under the sovereignty of God, but God has had no specific part in bringing it about and has no specific future or destiny uh, for that nation and that people. But um, in my estimation, Israel is the time clock of history. There is no other way of telling what time it is in the program of God than by what is happening uh, to the Jewish people. And it is really that that I want to set out by the grace of God this evening to prove to you. People often charge, those of us who believe, uh, that Israel is the fulfillment of God's prophetic word, and program, they charge us uh, with basing everything on Old Testament scriptures. They say that, uh, uh, a, that the New Testament says virtually, if actually, nothing at all about a Jewish future. Uh, but that um, the, the whole uh, concept is erroneously based on um, Old Testament prophecies, and their argument runs uh, along these lines. Um, we can't be sure that these prophecies have not already been fulfilled in the return from Babylon. And um, it is a very dangerous thing to base upon uh, such Old Testament uh, scriptures um, such a, a large and important uh, matter. Now, I personally am not afraid of the Old Testament. Uh, I, I, I notice that a lot of Christians only ever carry around with them a New Testament, which means they have precisely uh, less than half the Word of God. 
Um, the fact of the matter is God never meant the New Testament to be divided from the Old Testament or the Old Testament to be divided from the New Testament. And I personally am not afraid of the Old Testament. Um, I point out wherever I go that the early church only had an Old Testament. It comes as quite a sickening shock to some Christians to discover that the early church had no New Testament. The New Testament actually only really came into to being by the end of the first century, and even then was only in a very loose collection. Um, where did they find all those marvelous evangelical doctrines with which they turned the whole Roman world upside down? They found them all in the Old Testament. They found the most extraordinary things in the Old Testament. They even found baptism in Isaiah 53, and as I said to the Baptist College in New Zealand, in Auckland, um, a month or two ago, even you gentlemen might have some problem in finding baptism in Isaiah 53. But the early church didn't have Romans 6, and um, other such <laughs> scriptures. So they found by the Spirit of God baptism in Isaiah 53, and it led the Ethiopian eunuch not right through to baptism. And when he went back to Ethiopia, by the grace of God, he did a tremendous work which has lasted through to this very day. The fact of the matter is the early church had nothing else but the Old Testament. It was the Old Testament that the risen Christ, the risen Messiah, opened their understanding to. They saw him in every page. They saw him in all three main sections of the Old Testament. And um, it, it is, I think, a very exciting thing to recognize that, uh, to recognize the Jewishness of the early church for the tw first 20 years, that is almost two decades of church history, there wasn't a single Gentile in membership in the church. Every single one was Jewish. All the apostles were Jewish, not half Jewish, fully Jewish. Not one of them had a Gentile mother or even a Gentile father. They were all Jewish. Even those with Greek-sounding names like Stephen and Apollos and, uh, and uh, Stephen and Philip, they were all Jews. They were Greek-speaking Jews. It comes, I say, to a great shock to people to discover how very Jewish the early church was and that the New Testament of its 27 writings, 25 of them were written, humanly speaking, by Jews. Uh, we have two, Luke and Acts, written by the same hand, that might have been written by a Gentile or might have been written by a Gentile converted to Judaism. We are not sure. Uh, but that is a small fraction of the whole. And um, as I love to point out to the shock of the congregations that I go to over the world, <clears throat> most of the great cathedrals are named after Jews. <laughs> St. Paul's or St. Peter's or St. Mark's or St. Matthew's or St. Stephen's, they're all Jews. They thought they'd caught me out in New Zealand in Christchurch. They said, ah, but our cathedral in Christchurch, they said, is St. Mary's. And so I said to them, so? <laughs> <clears throat> who was Mary. He was also a Jewess. So it comes as a very great shock to some people to discover how very Jewish the early church was and how very Jewish the gospel is and to discover the simplicity but the profound truth contained in the words of the Lord Jesus. Salvation is from the Jews. Now, of course, um, uh, is it true that the New Testament says nothing about uh, uh, the uh, coming, uh, the the uh, about a Jewish future or about the regathering of the Jewish people? I can I say that it it says a lot. The fact is, the New Testament was never never written uh, to be read separately. It it came, if you like, it flowered on the stem of the Old Testament. And it is always with the understanding that everything in the Old Testament is absolutely valid truth. But even so, we have tremendous foundational statements in the New Testament. I haven't got time this evening because I want to take only one of those statements. Otherwise, we could have spent the whole evening going through Romans 11 verse by verse. And I think I can prove to you from Romans 11 that in that one marvelous and inspired statement, in one of the greatest setting forths of truth in the whole Bible, 
you have both the territorial recovery of the Jewish people and the political recovery of the Jewish people and the spiritual recovery of the Jewish people. But the word I want this evening to uh, talk about is the little word with which Jesus summed up the major discourse which he gave on his second advent. It is so important, this uh, um, uh, matter, this discourse, that it is recorded in all three synoptic gospels, in Matthew 23, in Mark 13, and in Luke 21. And this uh, uh, vitally significant uh, discourse of our Lord Jesus, he ended up with the words, having explained to them how things would begin at the last phase of world history, that there would be nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom and rumors of wars and wars and earthquakes and famines, that is shortages, and, uh, and plague diseases and persecution. And then went on to saying this is only the beginning of the sorrows. This is only the, the, the first birth pangs of the birth of the new age. Then he said there will come the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to stand. That ushers in the final phase of world history. And then you shall see the Son of Man coming uh, with power and great glory. And every eye shall see him. And then turning to those disciples, he said, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. Or learn its parable. Now, eh, what did our Lord Jesus mean by this? Because it's obviously important. All three synoptic gospels record it. What did Jesus mean when he said, from the fig tree learn its parable or learn its lesson? Did he have in mind the Jewish people? Or was he merely using an illustration from nature that when you see the leaves coming out on the fig tree, you know that summer is coming. Now, there are those who um, uh, contend that that's all Jesus did me. They say Luke, who was never afraid of paraphrasing things in order to make it abundantly clear uh, to those who were reading, he says, learn the parable of the fig tree when um, her... Uh, let me just uh, quote it exactly. Um, Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when her they now shoot forth, her branches shoot forth, and she puts forth leaves, you know that summer is coming. Now they say, you see, Luke was trying to tell us, don't have the Jewish people in mind. That's finished with. God's finished with them. The, the real meaning is, it's just like all the trees. When he spoke of the fig tree, he was speaking of all the trees. It's something that happens to all trees. In other words, it is an illustration of coming uh, summer. Now, the interesting thing is, if it is only a picture of coming summer, the fig tree is not um, the harbinger of spring in Israel. The real harbinger of spring, which means that we have about six weeks, six to eight weeks before the hot, dry summer season begins when we won't have another drop of rain for anything up to eight months and certainly not less than five or six. Um, the whole of the mountain areas of Jerusalem and elsewhere depend on dew every night. That's how everything is, how the grapes ripen, how the figs ripen, how the pomegranates ripen. They receive absolutely no, they just get it out of the dew. Um, uh, well, now, uh, the interesting thing is that the real harbinger of uh, spring followed by summer is the almond tree. That is the very first tree to put forth leaves. Actually, it blossoms before it puts forth its leaves. And that happens in the third and fourth week of January. Then we know that uh, we have the marvelous short period of all the flowers and of rain before come, there comes the dry summer season. 
The fig tree is quite different. <clears throat> the fig tree is the last of all the fruit trees to put forth its leaves in Israel, rather like the mulberry tree here in Britain. <clears throat> when the fig tree puts forth its leaves, we know that the summer season is literally upon us. We have anything up to two weeks, not much more. In other words, if Jesus was talking about the fig tree in that way, he was not talking about some great long period through which we would pass and which we, over which we could take our time and which we could sort of wait for a while before we got things put right and settled issues in our lives. But in actual fact, he was saying, when these things begin to come to pass, you have very little time left. And in fact, that's exactly what it says in Mark. Know ye, when you see these things beginning to come to pass, know ye that he is nigh even at the doors. He's not at Richmond Station. He's not at the Quadrant. He's not even at the foot of Halford Road. He is actually on the doormat. He is at the door. Now, when we begin to realize that uh, interpretation of uh, the fig tree, it comes as a shock to us. Of course, we have to speak relatively. I mean, we've had some 1,800 years at least through which we've passed, and we have to think of a period of time relative to that longer period. But even so, what it means is this, you haven't got a lot of time. But is that all Jesus meant? In actual fact, it is very interesting how Luke puts it. The whole early church owed a debt to Luke. Instead of putting, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to stand, let him that is on the rooftop not come down, but let him go out and let him that is in the field not come into the house, but flee into the mountains of Judea. I mean, we had, the whole early church had a real, were in real debt to Luke because he substituted the word abomination of desolation by the words, when you see the armies laying siege to Jerusalem. Now, if they had waited for the abomination of desolation to be actually set up where it ought not to stand, the um, actual abomination of desolation was a statue of Jupiter or Zeus that was put up on the brazen altar in the temple and a pig was sacrificed to it every day and the blood of the pig was sprinkled in the holy place. That was the abomination of desolation. Now, if the early church had waited till that happened, they would have waited till 70 AD and not a single one of them would have survived. They would have all died with the whole um, city of Jerusalem in the final stages of the siege. But they remember the words of Luke. When you see armies laying siege to Jerusalem, and when in 66 AD, four years before the destruction of Jerusalem, they saw the siege works going up all around the city with the Roman army hard at work, the whole early church fled en, en masse, en, in body, whole body, went down into the uh, Jordan Valley, crossed the River Jordan and went to a place called Bella, which is now in the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan on the other side, and survived. Now, this is interesting <clears throat> because, in other words, Luke was not afraid by the Spirit of God to give what we would call in Jewish circles a kind of Talmudic com commentary. In other words, he was not afraid by the Spirit of God to add something for our understanding. And this is what he said. When you see the fig trees and all the trees. In other words, if he had meant, no, all this is, is a picture of coming summer. He, what he would have said was, when you see all the trees, behold all the trees. When they shoot forth and put forth leaves, you know that summer is coming. Then we could have said, Luke was ruling out any significance or symbolism connected to a particular nation. But he didn't do that. What he said was this, behold the fig tree and all the trees. 
In other words, it was as if Luke was saying to us, there is a twofold significance in the words of the Lord Jesus. First of all, it is something to do with a particular tree. And secondly, it is something which happens not only to that tree, but to all trees. In other words, he was saying, let's put it the other way around, when you see all these things coming to pass, you know that summer is nigh. So when you see these things, when, when you see these leaves coming forth in the trees, you know that summer is nigh. When you see all these things beginning to come to pass, you will know that the kingdom of God is near at hand. But he was also saying, you must keep your eye on a particular nation a particular people. And when you have a conjunction of the signs, that is, all these other things happen, and at the same time, something happens to the Jewish people long dormant as a nation and as a state, then you will know the last phase of world history has begun. Now, have we any other proof for this? Have we any other evidence for this? Yes, we have. We have, in fact, a colossal amount of evidence. For instance, when we go back into the Old Testament, we find a little phrase, I believe we even sing it nowadays, um, every man shall sit under his own uh, vine and fig tree. And I suppose most Christians think of it as a, a very poetic and rather romantic a uh, kind of little phrase. It's a lovely hot evening like this evening, and you get the feeling of someone fanning themselves or sitting in the breeze in the cool under their fig tree and vine. Actually, it's an interesting thing that whenever you see the fig tree in uh, the more natural parts of Israel, you will also see the vine. The vine will grow up into the fig tree, and you very generally nearly always find them together. But that's not what the Lord was saying. Some pretty little picture of sort of sunsets and twittering birds and sort of zephyr-like breezes, um, <clears throat> you know, much as we would love them even this evening. Um, the fact of the matter is what the Lord Jesus was really saying was this. Every one of the children of Israel will have an allotment of the promised land for himself large enough to grow a fig tree on and grow a vine into the fig tree and sit under the shade of it. <laughs> In other words, here is the interesting thing. It's quite exciting. The first symbolism of the fig tree is not the nation, but the territory. It is to do with the promised land, first and foremost. And then later on, you remember how Jeremiah speaks of a great basket of figs that he saw in a vision, speaking of the fruitfulness of the people. And you find the Lord speaking about Israel as a fruitful uh, fig tree and a vine. You find it again and again in the Old Testament. But even more conclusive are the words of the Lord Jesus. In this very Gospel of Luke, in, I think, chapter uh, 6, and um, in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in chapter 13 and verse 6, we read this parable of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus spake this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit thereon and found none. And he said unto the vine dresser, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why did it also cumber the ground? And the, he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and it bear fruit, and if it bear fruit thenceforth, well, but if not, thou shalt cut it down. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus spoke this parable? Those who heard him, the Pharisees, knew exactly what he was meaning if nobody else does. They knew he was getting at them. Three years of the public ministry of the Messiah, Israel was the fig tree in the vineyard. He had come three years seeking fruit on that tree and found none. Then he said, cut it down. But the, the tenant farmer, the Holy Spirit, 
we would say, said, don't, don't do it. Just let us fertilize the ground and aerate the soil, and if then it doesn't bear any fruit, then cut it down. In fact, the Jewish people had a whole generation of 40 years, and in that 40 years, the ground was certainly spiritually aerated and certainly spiritually fertilized. It was the period of Pentecost, and all the great signs and wonders and miracles of the early church when the whole of that area of the world was turned upside down, but still they would not believe. And at the end of that generation, the tree was rooted up and cut cut down. But we have even further evidence. Even more interestingly, if you take Mark's gospel, where I think it's uh, very clear indeed, in Mark 13 and verse 20, Eight, we have the words, now from the fig tree learn the lesson. Now in Mark's gospel, those of you who will remember our studies on Mark, you will remember that this little gospel um, of the 16 uh, chapters covers the three years of the ministry of our Lord Jesus. It doesn't go back to his birth, but begins with his baptism at Jordan and ends with his ascension. But the interesting thing about Mark is this, that from Mark chapter 11, right through to Mark 15, the end of Mark 15, is only seven days in the life of the Lord Jesus. That is, one third of this whole gospel is to do with one week of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. And we come then to an amazing discovery. We find that when Jesus, the very afternoon or evening of the day that Jesus said to those disciples, from the fig tree learn its parable or lesson, the day before, something had dramatically taken place with a fig tree. And that very morning, those same disciples had drawn the master's attention to that fig tree. You will know it. It's in Mark 11. And um, you will remember the story, how Jesus was going up from Bethany. Jesus always liked to stay in Bethany because the air was probably much better in those days in Bethany than within the old walled city. And um, uh, he used to always spend uh, his uh, nights in Bethany and then used to come every day into the city and go back in the evening to Bethany. And on his way in with the disciples, as they came over the brow of the Mount of Olives, he, uh, he saw a fig tree, and uh, he went over to it. And um, it says he, he, he hungered. In other words, he showed sort of uh, uh, some kind of hunger. And um, he looked for fruit, and uh, he found none, and then he cursed the fig tree. Now, of course, I have, this is one of those marvelous occasions when you hear the most abject twaddle um, uh, talked. On the, I have got everywhere, dear old ladies come up to me and say, do you know there's one thing that bothers me terribly about Jesus? And when he cursed that fig tree, what a dreadful thing to do. And then, of course, you know, we believers are marvelously adept at defending the Bible. And when we defend the Bible, we actually <clears throat> make it more stupid than ever. If you know what I mean, at least we make it appear more stupid than ever. And you know the story about the person who, who said about the uh, uh, crossing of the Red Sea, you know, when it was supposed to be ankle deep. Of course, it wasn't over the Red Sea, it was over the Badawil Lagoon. Now, I've been in the Badawil Lagoon two or three times and waded right across to the little spit of sand on the edge. I mean, it, it was no miracle. I suppose you know the old lady who sort of said, Hallelujah, Pastor. Now I see it's a bigger miracle than ever because God drowned the Pharaoh's hosts and chariots in, in six inches of water. I mean, it, and I remember myself at a moral leadership course in Ismailia many, many years ago, the uh, uh, theologian telling us that, uh, of course, Jesus didn't walk on the on the the Lake of Galilee, he was, as we all know, he said, he was walking on one of the shallow shelves that are just a few inches below the sea. But the amazing thing was Peter sank in that narrow shelf. <laughs> it is amazing. The same man said about um, Elijah, you know, that of course he said, we all know that on Mount Carmel, a thing that the Israeli government hasn't yet discovered, and that there are great um, sources of benzene. 
And um, he said that water that they poured into the trenches, of course, that clear, looked like water, wasn't water at all. It was benzene. And so, of course, that's why the scripture says, the fire licked up the water. He said, he said to us, you've never seen fire licking up water, have you? But you've seen it licking up benzene. And I couldn't wait for the question period. Um, and when we got it, I said to him, it's very interesting, your explanation of Elijah, but um, where did the fire come from? And he looked terribly startled. And so I said, well, of course, it had to be from Elijah's cigarette. <laughs> I mean, really, when it comes to it, you see, you make, you make the word of God more stupid by the, you know, it's like these marvellous ideas about the first chapter of Genesis. Personally, I believe the Lord could have done the whole thing in six days, myself. I don't have any problem about it at all. He might not have even required six days. I sometimes think he could have all done it in one big bang, as some of them say today. But what I find extraordinary is when people tell me that it was 6,000 years. Because if you had 500 years of day, followed by 500 years of night, everything that lived in the day would die in the night. <laughs> but nobody thinks of these kind of things. And these wonderful theories, we try to adjust ourselves to scientific theory to make the, Bi the Bible more explicable and more helpful to the modern mind, but end up, in actual fact, making it rather stupid. Anyway, coming back to this matter, I am told by many that Jesus was only a man. And I am told that as a man, he, like everybody else, hungered. And they tell me that when you're hungry, you get irritable. And so when he went looking for fruit on the fig tree and couldn't find any in a fit of irritation, he cursed it. And of course it died. Well, that's not the Lord I know. I would have long ago been shot up with a lightning bolt if the Lord had these fits of irritation. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm only, I, you know, I'm only talking about myself. I haven't said anything about you. I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is that, uh, that uh, uh, that's not the Lord I know. I don't think it's the Lord you know. And furthermore, the writer of the record was not so dumb either. He actually puts there in black and white by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and it was not the season for fruit. In other words, the Lord Jesus must have not only been irritable, may he forgive me, he must have been dumb. Because it wasn't even the season for fruit. But he went over to a fig tree, a one who was always talking about the flowers and the birds and, and farming practices. He evidently didn't realize that it was spring and you don't get figs in spring. Of course, I don't accept it. I believe Jesus was acting out a parable. He knew very well that there was... Now, of course, some of these very wonderful people tell us, well, you know, the fig tree is exceptional. The fig tree, you can tell uh, long before the fruit comes whether it's going to be fruitful. Because where the leaves come out, there are little fruit grafts. And if they're present, you know it's going to bear fruit. And if they're not, you know it's going to be barren. Now, this is absolutely wonderful and would explain everything, but for the simple fact that it is the Spanish fig tree, which was only imported into Israel at the beginning of this century. Our own native Palestinian fig tree, or Israeli fig tree, there is no way of telling whether it's going to have fruit or not until it actually appears a little later. Now, that makes it quite clear to me that Jesus deliberately went over at a time when there was no fruit and no way of telling whether the thing would be fruitful, although he would know. And he went to the charade of looking for fruit in the tree and evidently loudly saying, I'm hungry, finding none, and then pronouncing a word over the tree. Now, they didn't realize it at the time, only afterwards when the Holy Spirit had come upon them as always when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. 
he began to educate and began to enlighten and began to make everything fall into place. And when they came to write the record, they put it like this. And they went down into the temple and Jesus made a a whip of cords, and he drove out all those that had made the temple a place of merchandise, saying, My father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers and thieves. In other words, they connected it with the priesthood. That afternoon, evening, they went back to Bethany. And the next morning, the very morning in which Jesus had learned the parable of the fig tree, they were going again over the brow when Peter, always Peter, when Peter suddenly saw the fig tree and he said, Master, look at that fig tree. And then we have our second amazing little um, set of interpretations. I've heard people talking about, Jesus said, yes, do you see it? Have faith in God. For I tell you, whatsoever you shall believe when you ask the Father, you believe that you have, if you have faith, you don't doubt in your heart, you shall have it. As if the Lord Jesus was saying, if you want to kill fig trees, all you need is faith. Now, again, I don't want to be facetious, but the easiest way to kill a fig tree, you don't need to go through all that palaver, you just need to cut the thing down. I mean, it's very, very simple. I mean, it wasn't as if Jesus was giving us some technique for removing fig trees or, or killing fig trees. The point was, what he was saying was this when he said, have faith in God, because when you really trust in the Lord, then there's fruit. And when you don't trust in the Lord, but trust in yourself and your own opinions and concepts, you get barren. Always it's the same thing. It is the same line, same pedigree. F living faith always leads to growth, which always leads to fruitfulness. And unbelief or disbelief always leads to death and barrenness. Then the gospel writers tell us Jesus had, at least Matthew, tells us he had his great confrontation with the temple authorities. They went down into the city, and then they all came to him. First, the royal party, the Herodians, with their trick questions. Then the Sadducees, with their trick questions. Then the Pharisees, with their trick questions. And then that lawyer who came and said, Master, what is the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus replied in a totally Jewish way, the first and great commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy might. And then he added the second. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he uttered the most terrible denunciation found anywhere in the Bible. The one that begins, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, and ended up with almost the sob in his voice. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem that stonest the prophets and killest those that are sent to her. How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but he would not. Your house is left unto you. He never called the temple your house. He'd always called it my father's house. Your house is left unto you desolate. You shall no more see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. Then he went out of the temple with his disciples. And as they were going out, one of them said, Master, look at these magnificent stones, this magnificent building. It's been 43 years in building. He said, do you see it? In the day of its visitation, not one stone will remain on another, which is absolutely true. What the stones you see today are the retaining wall of the platform. The whole temple, there's not a single stone left of either the walls that were above the retaining platform or the actual buildings on the temple. And going out through the gate beautiful, 
he descended into the Kidron Valley and crossing the little stream as it then was now underground, he went over onto the lower slopes of the Mount of Olives and left eight of those disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane and taking the four, the inner circle, Andrew, Peter, James and John, he went up on the Mount of Olives somewhere where the whole city lay like a, with a panoramic view below him. And sitting down, they said to him, Master, when shall these things be? In other words, when will this temple be destroyed and this city judged? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? For them, it all seemed to be one thing. We know it's two. And then Jesus began. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in many places and famines and uh, plague diseases. And they shall persecute you all over the place and think that they do God a service. And then there will come the abomination of desolation. And then, he said, summing everything up, learn the parable of the fig tree. Are you going to tell me that those four men, and especially Peter, didn't immediately have a certain fig tree conjured up in their mind? That fig tree that something had happened the day before, and to which Peter, one of the four, had that very morning drawn the Lord's attention to? Now from the fig tree, learn its... It was as if Jesus was saying, now listen, you are all going to live to see the destruction of this nation and of this city. But don't come to false conclusions. Don't think that because this city will be destroyed and this house, this uh, temple will be leveled and because this nation will... Uh, uh, fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all nations, that that is the end of the Jewish people. Don't think that because the fig tree is fruitless, has been judged, has withered from the roots, and has finally been cut down and rooted up, that that's the end. At the end of the age, that same fig tree will be back in its same ground, not dead, not withered, but with sap rising up from its roots through its trunk into its branches, putting forth leaves. Now, I don't know whether you need any more evidence, but I can give you a bit more. It will shock you. But I can give you a little more evidence if you want it. Because, but it makes us all look so stupid. You know, we are all very arrogant. Every generation of Christians has been arrogant. And we, of course, myself, we're none of us excluded. We're all very arrogant. Sometime or another, we look down our nose at those preceding generations. We sort of say, oh, when we hear about the Anabaptists in the time of Martin Luther, thinking the Lord was returning. <laughs> this is ridiculous. And then we think about some of the Methodists, how excited they got about the coming of the Lord. And we say, oh, dear, dear, dear. And then we think about some of the Irvingites. And we say, oh, well, they were a cult, weren't they? And then we think about some of the other. You know, we all the way through history, there were people who thought the Lord was coming back. And, of course, the liberals tell us that the Apostle Paul thought the Lord was coming back. They love to tell it us with glee. They say, you know, even the Apostle Paul was mistaken and thought that Jesus was coming back uh, in his sort of lifetime changed his opinion toward the end of his letters and said he thought it would be a little longer than he first thought. <clears throat> but the fact is, it never did them any harm, did it? It's never done anybody any harm thinking the Lord's coming. It's a blessed hope that purified. Of course, if you go up on the top of mountains from a fixed dates, which is entirely wrong, of course, it can do you a lot of harm. But when you live in the light of the possibility that the Lord may return, it does you no harm. But my dear friends, I, I must tell you, it's come to me as a great shock. How, how could we dare be so arrogant? Listen, if other generations did not understand or only sort of faintly understood 
that something had to happen to the Jewish people before the Lord returned, of course they could be misled. For instance, may I just take some of these signs that the Lord Jesus gave and, and take a somewhat, I hope, constructively critical uh, uh, look at them. Wars and rumors of war and nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom, can you tell me at any time in the last 1,800 years when that has not been true? Of course, we have television. Yeah. Makes a great difference. Radio and television makes a great way. We know as soon as there's an uprising in China, we know it instantly. As soon as something happens in Sudan, we know it instantly. As soon as Chad, we know it instantly. Indonesia, we know it instantly. South America, instantly. Even the Falklands. I mean, we know everything instantly. I mean, it's here. We watch it all on the television, on the box. In the old days, it took them a year or more before they even heard about these things. But can you tell me any time when there hasn't been war and rumors of war? So what kind of sign is that? Oh, but you say, you mustn't say a thing like that. We didn't come here to Halford House to listen to our faith in God's word being sort of undermined. I mean, Jesus said that the sign was wars and rooms of it. He meant it. And so you say to me, he meant universal war. So? So he meant universal war. Then how did any particular generation know that the wars they were experiencing weren't the worst? Put yourself in their shoes. Take the Hundred Years' War. Now, even the First and Second World War didn't last a hundred years, thank God. But the Hundred Years, those of you who know anything about history, you will know the Hundred Years' War laid the whole of Europe. It ravaged it. It lay at waste. It was the most terrible disaster that fell upon European civilization. What about the Thirty Years' War? What about all the other wars? What about Napoleon? Do you know that the second advent and testimony, as it was called, preparation movement, began really as a result of dear old Nat? <laughs> they felt that, you know, such a quickening everywhere that they thought that this could be the Antichrist, his idea to have an empire that was like the Holy Roman Empire stretching from the Atlantic to the Urals and from the Mediterranean to um, the North Sea. They thought, this has to be the Antichrist. Well, I don't blame them, frankly. And the, But you say, ah, but now just wait. You're not being fair. What about earthquakes? So, what about earthquakes? Can you tell me any time in the last 1,800 years when there haven't been major earthquakes? I can tell you earthquakes that have been in China which have wiped out half a million people. Enormous earthquakes there have been in these 1,800 years. So what is there special about an earthquake? And so you say, well, famine. Well, I don't think we've had famines. Not, not in this, anything like some of the famines that have swept India and have swept uh, Africa and have swept China in particular, in which people actually ate all the bark on trees and thereby killed the trees. Ate all the seeds so that there was nothing to plant so that in the long term it was a, a catastrophe. And what about plague diseases? Oh, you say, well, now... Well, we, we had the great flu epidemic, you know, in uh, sort of thing. We've had Asian flu more recently and things like that. But, uh, but what about the Black Death? Now, I'm only trying, I'm not trying to destroy your faith in God's word. I'm trying to get at something. What I'm saying is this. When, when, when almost 85 to 87% of the whole population of Britain, Scandinavia and Europe died in the Black Death, can you blame those believers for thinking the Lord must be coming? Nothing has ever happened like this before because with the Black Death came famine. Nobody was there to sow the fields. All the guilds and the professions were finished. There were valleys in Norway where every single inhabitant died. Whole family lines came to an end. You know, 
Again, those of you who know anything about history, you know some of the great techniques for dyeing cloth, for stained glass and other things died out with the Black Death because they never wrote it down. They passed it from father to son. They died so suddenly there was no way of passing it down. It was a disaster. Now, just let me get you again on, on another point. What about the persecution of believers? Oh, you say, well, now, now. Now, that is 20th century, isn't it? Really? I can understand the believers in the Inquisition. Aren't you? Maybe they thought the Lord was coming. They did. There have been other periods of enormous persecution, one way or another. Now, what I'm trying to say is this. Jesus was not as stupid as that. He didn't just take a whole lot of things that he knew very well were common to the whole of this 1,800 years. He, of course, meant when you come to a period of time when there will be wars and rumors of wars on a universal scale, when nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom all over the world at the same time, when there will be earthquakes at the same time, and famines, and plague diseases, and persecution, and something happens to the Jewish people, then you will know you pass into the last phase of world history. In other words, the Jewish people they're the recreation of the Jewish state, the revival and renewal of Jewish national consciousness is the validating sign of all the other signs. If it is absent, you know the time has not come. But the moment it happens, you know. And that's why Luke said, behold the fig tree and all the trees. In other words, he was saying, get, first of all, something has to happen to a particular fig tree, and then take the general in all, and you'll know it's happening. You get it? Now, my dear friends, I think that's exciting. I don't know about you, but I find it exciting. Because there's one thing we can say, that in the last 1,800 years, nothing has ever happened to the Jewish people that could ever be called the recreation of statehood. It is true that in the Middle Ages, they've, uh, due to the Inquisition, there was a big drift back to, to the Holy Land. But I mean, it was certainly not the recreation of statehood. Hebrew was not spoken. I mean, the amazing thing is this, that all of a sudden, literally in this last century, in the 20th century, it all happened. First, there's been a massive going back in wave after wave after wave of what we call Aliyah, immigration, waves of immigration. Then there has come the revival of Hebrew, a unique, of a unique phenomenon in world history, not in any of the, of, of the uh, chronicles of mankind will you find anywhere a single evidence of a language that has ceased to exist as a spoken living language being revived after at least 2,000 years of deadness. To become the virile and volatile uh, communicable language of a contemporary nation. And people. It's all happened in this one century. We have passed three milestones in my estimation, and this is how we will spend the rest of our time together this evening. Three prophetic milestones. You know, all our troubles come when, um, uh, when we try to work out prophecy uh, ahead of its time, if you understand what I mean. We sort of try to think. Now, this Gog and Magog war in Ezekiel 38 and 39, surely it'll come this way, or come that way, or come the other. And I have to tell you that basically we have to wait for the fulfillment. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to be at sea. But it means we can never be dogmatic until major prophecies have been fulfilled. But when they have been fulfilled, they give the light to a whole number of other prophetic details. 
Now, we have passed three, in my estimation, three major prophetic milestones, all connected with the fig tree. And the first, of course, is uh, the recreation of the Jewish state on the uh, 14th of May, 1948. It was, of course, the fulfillment of the words of Isaiah the prophet. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such a thing? Shall a land uh, be born in a day? Shall a nation be brought forth at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Now, I'm told by some learned doctors of theology uh, that these words of Isaiah are, uh, uh, are all fulfilled in Pentecost. I have no problem in spiritualizing the word in one sense um, because it is true that the church is called a holy nation, an elect race, a peculiar people. Um, and we who belong to them know just how peculiar they are. But, I mean, we have no problem about that. Um, uh, the fact is that uh, um, it, it, it is true. But is it not marvellous that the Holy Spirit has inserted certain phrases in this prophetic word which cannot be spiritualized and applied to the church? Who hath heard such things? Who hath seen such a thing? Shall a land be born in one day. Now, nowhere in the New Testament is the church described as a land. If we were to put it in colloquial language, we would say, shall a state be born in one day? Or shall a country be born in one day? And the church is never called a country. It's never called a state as such. It's called a nation. It's called a race. But it's never called a state or country. And then again, and, and, but if we uh, uh, believe that on the 14th of uh, May, 1948, uh, this word has been fulfilled, then it has been literally fulfilled. For in one single day, a miracle happened, and the Jewish state was born. Now, the interesting thing is that the whole world said, including all the political and military analysts and experts, they were united in their verdict. There wasn't one dissenting voice. They all said this little Jewish state was going to be liquidated, swallowed up, overcome, snuffed out within days of its birth. There were over one million armed men in five Arab armies fully mobilized to go to war with this little Jewish state on the day of its birth. Three of those five Arab armies were British trained and British equipped. There were 60,000 Jewish settlers in what we call the Yeshu. They had pistols, old-fashioned rifles and guns, and one Pied Piper cubby craft with one propeller. <coughs> and with this, they had to face a million armed men. This little Yeshu, num numbering some 600,000 men and women, had agreed unanimously, more or less, uh, to the United Nations partition resolution. The United Nations had decided to carve up Israel. Thank God the Lord intervened. But still, the United Nations, in its almighty wisdom, had decided to carve up the Holy Land. And it is amazing. Now, when I look at the map, Little enclaves here and enclaves there and little things and Jerusalem, an internationalized city, and I don't know what else. This was their plan. Now the Jewish settlers accepted it. They knew there was no other way. But all the Arab inhabitants of the land and all the Arab neighbors 
unanimously rejected it and went to war. And the world held its breath. And the 60,000 overcame the 1 million and ended up with far more territory than ever the United Nations would have given them. The War of Independence. But there's another phase in this little prophetic word which is quite remarkable. Listen to this. For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. If this is to be fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, what does it mean? I thought the church was Zion, according to their theology. So how did the church travail for the church? I find that rather extraordinary. I mean, I've never heard of a mother conceiving and then travelling for her own birth. Have you? It makes a little bit of mockery, it seems to me, of the word of God. And it's as if the Holy Spirit put this, oh, someone says terribly spiritual. No, it's Jesus. The travail of Jesus. But where is Jesus called Zion? If I read the prophet Isaiah, I find Jesus himself, the Messiah, saying, for Zion's sake I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake I will take no rest. Until. In other words, I feel that the Holy Spirit has inserted this word again because he wants us to understand that there, there has to be an actual fulfillment of these words. And when we look at the Jewish people um, as Zion, they never did travel. For 1,700 years, the Jews were taught passively to accept their faith. They were taught by the rabbis, this is a judgment of God. You must not murmur, you must not rebel, and above all, you must not resist. If they persecute you, accept it. If they hound you from pillar to post, allow them to do so. Do not fight. Do not resist. Always passively accept. They went much further. They said that the whole Jewish settlement should wear black that they should have that kind of haunted look, which was literally something that grew almost so that it became an innate, inherent, pathological quality of jury. That kind of sad look in the eye. To this day, people will come sometimes to a Jew and say, I know you're Jewish by the sadness in your eye. To this day. It is extraordinary. In the liturgy of the synagogue, there's always been a waver, or a quaver, a kind of sob that went, it's gone now, back in the land, because we're back in the land. But before, it was a kind of mournful wail before God. We're not where we should be, and it's our fault. I could go on and on telling you things, but it would take too long. The fact of the matter is, the Jewish people were taught to accept this whole thing and not to resist. And that's one of the great condemnations of the Holocaust, that except for the Warsaw Ghetto Rising and a few other marvellous exceptions, on the whole, the Jewish people went like lambs to the slaughter in their hundreds of thousands. Indeed, I remember old w Mr. Wolf here from Brewer Brewer's Lane with his tattooed mark over his arm um, saying to me, I saw them going into the gas chambers. That's why he could never believe. He used to look into my face and when we first began here and he used to say, if I only had your faith, Lance, if I only, I can see you got it. But he said, I can't have it. And then he used as if he always forgot me. He used to stand up and he was the strong man in the Hungarian state circus <laughs> in those days. And he was still a strong man. His great hand would come down to the kitchen table and it would nearly split. In fact, on one occasion, not when I was there, he did split it. It would come down the whole place, you know, those sort of 12th century cottages down in Brewers Lane, would shake. And then he would say, as if he'd forgotten me, talking into the ceiling, I can't believe in you! If you'd been there, you would have come out. On the day before he was liberated, he only, only survived because he was set to work digging the pits for all the bodies that could no longer be burnt. So many were being killed in the last days of Auschwitz. And the day before he was liberated, his grandparents, all three of his surviving grandparents, 
his mother, his uncle, his aunt, his cousin, their children, his wife, his own three children, were all liquidated. But he said to me, those people went into those gas chambers singing. They went in with joy. He said, on one occasion, I saw them dance a horror. Hasid, Hasids. You know the ones with the long... They danced because they would be, had been taught accept it with worship. And he was the one who told that wonderful story of the old grandfather with the white beard and his little son and the little boy weeping because of some intuition of trouble. And the old grandfather sweeping him up in his arm and hugging him and saying, shh, one hour and we shall see God. These people went to their deaths passively. But it was about only the end of the last century that a change took place. It had already begun early, but I, I can't tell you all that. It would take far too long. But it was at the end of the last century, with the rise of, a, of the birth of a man called Theodor Herzl, who became the great sort of symbolic uh, focal point of Jewish aspirations and hope, born in an assimilated Jewish middle-class banking family. He believed that Jews should assimilate. He even said they should be christened or confirmed in the Roman Catholic or Lutheran Church so they could take their place with their fellow citizens in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It all ended with the trial of Captain Dreyfus. When the whole of France, Republican France, which had given Jews for the first time equal citizenship and equal rights, when they took to the streets crying, death to the Jews, death to the Judases. And Herzl went up and down in the Tuileries Gardens and he couldn't understand it and he had no faith in God. He was an agnostic. But he says himself in his journal, as I went up and down, I thought, what, what can we do? What can we do? It's as if my, all my aspirations and hopes are dead. And suddenly, he says, it was as if heaven opened and I saw a vision of a recreated Jewish nation. From that moment, Theodor Herzl became like a man obsessed with an idea. He himself said it was like an Amazon river that swept him along. Whatever he did, when he went to sleep, when he did his journalistic work, whatever he did, he said it took him along. He went everywhere pleading with the leaders of Jewry in Germany, France, in Britain, and in Eastern Europe and Russia. His message was the same everywhere. If you do not devote your energies, your wealth, and your time and talents to the recreation of a Jewish state, the Gentile majority around us will one day liquidate you. But they laughed him to scorn. The Rothschilds and the Hirschs and the Montefiores and the David Goldsmith and all the other great Jewish noble families, they laughed him to scorn. He was a Jewish mystic, a, a kind of Jewish rabble raiser. The ordinary people listened to him. But German Jews said, Germany is our fatherland. French Jews said what they'd said to Napoleon. Paris is our Jerusalem, France is our Zion. These were the people who died in the Holocaust or their children. Herzl called a congress in September of 1897. It was in the Stadt Casino in Basel. It was the first time only with the wisdom of hindsight did anyone recognize it. It was the first time since the Sanhedrin was disbanded in 70 AD that all Jew le Jewish leaders representing every facet of Jewish life had met together. And on the day that the Congress opened, Theodor Herzl rose to address the people. And in that opening address, he said, we are here to lay the cornerstone of a structure that will house the Jewish nation. They chose a Jewish flag, and they chose a Jewish national anthem, and they had no territory, no government, and no hopes of one. It was laughable. The whole world roared with laughter. And that night, Herzl wrote in his, in his diary, this day, I have founded the Jewish state. If I were to say it out loud, he said, 
the whole world would uh, greet it with howls of derision and laughter. But in five years, perhaps, certainly within 50, the whole world will know. It was exactly 50 years. Exactly. Just a few weeks. It was in the beginning of November, 1947, that the United Nations had a two-thirds majority vote, including the switch of Russia from against to for, that the world body of nations recognized the right of the Jewish people to be a sovereign nation amongst other nations. It had happened. The 50 years between 1897 and 1947 were the most traumatic years of the, of the long, sad Jewish story. Two-thirds of Jewry died in the gas oven of Nazi-occupied Europe. But in that 50 years, Zion travailed. And as soon as Zion traveled, she brought forth her children. For when it was all over, there were two million survivors from concentration camps, broken in body, broken in heart, broken in mind. One million of them under the age of 12. And they stole out by every means possible from those forced labor camps, those... Uh, 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 concentration camps which had now been turned into places where there was medical help and proper food and facilities but for them it was a hell they couldn't stay they thought the world would accept them America took 1,400 of them in no nation would take those survivors so they were herded back into the concentration camps all cleaned up, looked after but no one knew what to do Britain wouldn't allow them into Palestine And they stole out until the trickle became a river and the river became an Amazon. And then the whole might of Britain moved against them. That awful man, Ernest Bevan. It is not known generally in Britain. For many years, Britain banned the film Exodus. Wouldn't allow it here. If you want to check the facts, you'll know it's true. For over 10 to 15 years, they wouldn't allow it even to be shown here. Most British people do not know that the RAF bombed defenseless refugee ships. But that was the story. And God won it. Zion Travis, she brought forth her children. The miracle happened. The fig tree was suddenly back in its own land with its roots in its own soil, drawing up the goodness from the soil, putting forth its leaves. But I must rush on, for there's a second milestone. That milestone tells us we've passed into the last phase. Now we understand wars and rumors of wars, a nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and earthquakes and famines and plagues and, and, and persecution. Now we begin to see it in, in a new light. But the second milestone was on the 7th of June, 1967. I think most of you know what happened on the 7th of June, 1967. In a lightning move on the part of the Israel Defense Forces, they, 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 they took the old city of Jerusalem. Now, the interesting thing is, just to put the record straight, Israel had no plans, no plans to take the old city in one sense. Yes, she had contingency plans if she was attacked. But she had already, twice, unofficially, through chan other channels, sent messages to King Hussein of Jordan, keep out of this war, and we will not fire a single shot at you. But Hussein thought that the gains would be too great if he were to come in. And so with Egypt and Syria... He launched that sudden war on Israel. And you remember how, how Israel preempted it by wiping out the air force of five Arab neighbors in a few hours. Then on the 6th of June, they surrounded the city and 
the paratroopers coming in through the Lion Gate and the uh, commandos coming in through Zion Gate, they met at the Western Wall. They, they could hardly believe that it had happened. For 19 years, no Jew had been allowed to pray at what the Christians called the Wailing Wall. It is a derisive term. No Jew had ever prayed at the Western Wall for 19 years. Every single day, every observant Jew, three times a day, in the Amidah prayer, that's the standing prayer it means, turns towards Jerusalem and prays for the restoration of Jerusalem, the building up of Jerusalem, and its liberation, and its glory. Two of the major festivals, uh, Passover and Yom Kippur, end with the words, next year in Jerusalem, but it had never happened. Not in 1,800 years. It had never happened. And then suddenly, <coughs> it happened. Yitzhak Rabin, who was then Prime Minister, uh, uh, yes, Prime Minister. Um, at the time, I think I might guess he took over. I think, uh, but if not, he was uh, general in charge of the of the Jerusalem area. Um, in his report, said that the hardened, battle weary paratroopers leant on those grey old historic stones and wept like babies. They could not believe that the miracle had happened. Jesus had already said it would. He had said, For, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now there are some Christian theologians who interpret this verse as to mean this. They say that Jesus was saying, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of unsaved people until the Messiah comes back. Well, now, if Jesus had said that, why didn't he say it? <laughs> I mean, why didn't he say it? Why didn't he say, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of, of the heathen or the unsaved until I return? But he didn't. He said, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, here is the interesting thing. He said, and there shall be great wrath to this nation and great distress to this people. Now, everybody understands that to be the Jewish people. Church never took distress or wrath to themselves in these interpretations, only the blessing. So we know it was the Jewish people. And then it says, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. That also is quite clear. It's the Jewish people. And they shall be led captive into all nations. That's quite clear. It's the Jewish people. So how can you interpret Jerusalem in any other way? And their national capital, their political capital, their commercial capital, their spiritual capital shall be trodden down of non-Jews until the times of the non-Jews be fulfilled. In other words, Jesus was giving a time limit. He was saying there's a time limit to the non-Jews being over Jerusalem, but there will come a day when Jerusalem shall once again be under Jewish sovereignty. And it happened on the 7th of May, uh, 7th of June, 1967. Now, my dear friends, the exciting thing about this is also rather wonderful. You know those 50 years? I think most of you know 50 years in the Bible is Jubilee. Do you know the significance of Jubilee in the Bible? Milton? Jubilee is the return of the possessions, whether in land or property, to its rightful owner. So in 1897, claim was laid with a national anthem and a national flag. And 50 years later, the land was possessed. But here is another interesting thing. On the 9th of December, 1917, something happened in Jerusalem which for everyone who was alive at the time, and some of them are still alive today, was a dramatic, sensational event that just influenced the rest of their lives. General Allenby, Edmund Allenby, of the Allied forces, dismounted from his horse up by Newgate 
And in the great jubilant crowds of Oriental Jews, Jews being almost two thirds of the city's population at the time, which most people don't know. They think there was a majority of Arabs that have been displaced by the Jews since, it's not true. In the great crowd of jubilant Oriental Jews, he took his hat off, took his gloves off, and very loudly said as he walked down Jaffa Road through to Jaffa Gate, I will not ride into the city of my God and King, hatty and gloved. He went through Jaffa Gate and onto the little platform which you can see to this day opposite Christ Church, for those of you who know Jerusalem. And there were all the Turkish dignitaries of the municipality gathered to sign the Declaration of Surrender. 400 years of Ottoman Empire rule ended that day. 700 years of Arab Muslim rule ended that day. And do you know why a thrill went right through the whole Jewish population? Because, seemingly, by coincidence, it happened to be the first day of the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. Now, Hanukkah is the festival of freedom or sometimes called the Festival of Light. And in John, the Gospel of John, it's called the Feast of Dedication. And it is the time when we commemorate, even Jesus went up to commemorate it, remember that. Um, people forget these little things because they have got so gentleized in their reading, they don't understand just how Jewish it all is. You know, in that Hanukkah festival, we commemorate the deliverance by God to the Maccabees from the original Antichrist, Antiochus IV. The man who became the archetype of Antichrist in the Bible. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So a thrill went right to the whole Jewish population. They wondered, has our redemption come? Has something sensational taken place that suddenly Muslim Arab rule ends and a Christian power takes over? Is this the beginning of the redemption? Fifty years later, give a few weeks, and uh, it happened. And uh, uh, Jerusalem was retaken. In other words, the miracle took place. And the, the property returned to its rightful owner 50 years later. Perhaps even more interesting, just a few weeks before, there's the Balfour Declaration. I suppose everybody here has heard of the Balfour Declaration, which was to change history. It all happened 50 years before. 50 years later, it took place. A milestone, folks. Now, my dear friend, if that's a milestone, it means you should wake up. So should I. Because what it means is this. You and I have passed into the last phase of world history. We've not just passed the first bit, we've passed the second stage. We've not only passed the regaining of Jewish statehood and territory, we've now passed the capital being restored. But the third milestone was undoubtedly, in my estimation, the Yom Kippur War of the 6th of October. Because if now it has so happened that uh, the... Um, the times of the Gentiles are over, then it seems to me that suddenly Israel will once again occupy the center of the world stage. She's only a nation of three and a half, four million people. But already we have the fifth strongest Air Force Army and Navy in the world. Because it'll be nothing when we face the Soviets, which we will do before long. But I mean, it is amazing to me that you can't open your newspaper without somewhere or other reading about Israel or Jerusalem or something. It's come to the heart. Now, on the 6th of October, 1973, on the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, a war was suddenly launched upon Israel by two of our neighbors. Unexpectedly and suddenly, they should have won it. But by the mercy and grace of God, they not only didn't win it, Israel ended up 50 miles from Cairo and 20 miles from Damascus. I understood from that that we had passed into yet another sub-phase, if you like, of the last days. We were in the run-up to a very big conflict. My dear friends, it has been the mercy of God that he's held that whole thing back. 
year after year after year in these past years to give the people of God everywhere through the world time to get ready, time for the shock, time to be able to face realities and time to come through with something for God. I've gone everywhere talking about it, of course, naturally. Um, I suppose we've been guilty as everybody in this kind of thing of sometimes misinterpreting details of the events and other things, saying, you know, that maybe things would happen quicker than they did and all the rest of it. We've learnt from that. But risking ridicule from all kinds of people over the world, where I have gone everywhere warning the people of God that the world is in for a terrible shaking. Now, I have to tell you, the pre-73 war, uh, the pre-73 uh, world is a quite different world to the one we're living in today. All the energy crisis, all the terrorism, international lawlessness and terrorism, the enormous growth of immorality, of the new kind of society and everything else, it's all taken an enormous leap forward, it seems to me, in the last ten years. I went everywhere telling people, keep your eye on Persia. I used to be asked more questions about Iran than anything else I ever mentioned when I I used to say, if the Gog and Magog war in Z Ezekiel 38 and 39 is going, going to be fulfilled before very long, something has to happen to Iran. People used to say to me in the States and, and elsewhere, the United States will never allow the Shah to fall. They've equipped him. They've invested billions of dollars worth of equipment and money in the Shah. He is the bastion um, of the West in the whole of Central Asia. They won't let him fall. But it happened. It didn't just happen that the Shah went and we have a sweet kind of rather corrupt but democratic type of, of, of sort of regime in Iran. The most violent, the most demonic, the most hellish regime in the world since Adolf Hitler and Stalin has raised its ugly head. It's brought death and bloodshed to tens of thousands of people. It's the Islamic revolution. It is my conviction, as I said to the folks in Westminster Chapel on Saturday, that before very long, the Ayatollah Khomeini will unofficially, if he hasn't already done so, put out feelers to the Kremlin. He is far too intelligent, far too shrewd, and far too demonically inspired to think that he can liquidate Israel without the arms of the Soviet Union. Nobody else is going to supply him with the kind of weapons he needs to do this dirty job. At present, the Islamic Revolution and Khomeini are not on speaking terms with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union with them. Why? Because Khomeini has executed all 60 of the Tudor Communist Party's leadership, including their wives and children. But that will not stop them. Khomeini believes that he can exploit the Kremlin and he believes because Allah is in this whole thing and has destined the Islamic revolution to win because Israel is the last satanic obstacle to the conquest of Islam, of Islam's conquest of the world. Don't forget that Islam has within its very theology the uh, concept that the whole world has to submit. Islam means submission. That's why they're building everywhere mosques. <clears throat> I'm not saying that all Muslims are evil. Not at all. Many are good. But this Islamic revolution, this Shiite form of Islam is demonic. Khomeini believes that the Shiites who've been the underdenomination of Islam for all these years are destined by Allah to take over and win and become the dominant factor in Islam in the last phase. He believes that Israel is the satanic creation of the powers of darkness to frustrate Allah's program and purpose for the nations. Therefore, he has said for 50 years, every Muslim must mobilize. First, he said, if there is a Jewish state, 
We've got to stop it. And if it comes into being, it will be a judgment of God and used as a catalyst by Allah to draw out the fervor and strength and devotion of the Muslim masses. And so it's happened. The Kremlin, I believe, will also put out feelers toward the... Um, uh, toward Khomeini, and I'll tell you why. I said on Saturday, and was no, in Denmark, and was corrected by one of, the, of Europe's leading uh, uh, Marx, Marxist uh, uh, experts um, that uh, the Soviet Union has 20 million Muslim citizens. In fact, it has 35 million, and that's conservative. They believe that it's probably nearer 50 million. And now the Ukrainians, the Russians, the Lithuanians, Estonians, and Latvians are, are only 50 million, and they have actually as many Muslim things. It is thought by many. They are growing at the rate of 10,000 a month. It's a demographic time bomb. So, my dear friends, I believe the Soviet Union will try to divert the attention of its Muslim citizens by saying, you should help, let us help the Islamic Revolution to liberate Jerusalem and finally solve the Jewish problem. If what I say is true, Iran has gone, Libya has gone. I don't have to say anything about Libya, not in Britain, and not in Greater London, I imagine. And do I need to say anything about Turkey? It's possible that something has to happen to Turkey. It's possible before. It seems to me that our time, as far as the next fulfillment of major prophecy goes, is sort of like quarter to 12. It may mean that we have years. It may mean we have months. I don't know. I have no doubt at all that we're heading for this kind of trouble. I've said it for years, and I say it again. Because I am 100% convinced that we need to be prepared psychologically, spiritually, and physically for the days that lie ahead. Now, whether this will include all of Europe, I have no idea at all. I only know that the Soviets have moved into Syria weapons that have not been seen outside of the boundaries of the Soviet Union. We now have SAM miss anti-aircraft missiles that can neutralize the whole airspace of Iraq, of, uh, of Jordan, of Israel, of Lebanon, up to the Cyprus coast. That means that anything that flies within that area could be neutralized if they want it. We have SS-21 missiles, which have a range that cover every single major Israeli city except for Elat. Even the nuclear development center at Dimona comes within the range of the SS-21. Just recently, the Syrian defense minister said that if Israel was so foolish as to start a war with Syria, uh, the Soviet Union had promised to send, within eight hours, two divisions of Soviet shock troops. Now, that's 20,000 men within eight hours. We have no doubt about it that that is what is going to happen. Whether in the next round of fighting the Soviets actually come right in uh, uh, on the front line or whether they only remain in the back, we are not, we are not convinced yet. But I am quite sure that even if we have a round of war, a four, five, six day war with Syria in the next few months, and the Soviets are just sort of involved as uh, background supporters, I have no doubt that in the next year or two we're going to see something far, far more serious. The Soviet Union has scores to settle with Israel. She has sunk, after all, a nuclear submarine, she has sunk a warship, she has downed Soviet transport planes, all unofficially. The Soviet Union is not going to let Israel get, she has a score to settle with her. And in the end, she's, Israel's the only country that's ever taken on the Soviet Union. So far. Now, that's, as you heard on some of your thing about Chenyenko's recurring nightmare that um, 
that the, Chi that the Chinese would learn to fight like the Jews and that the Jews would learn to multiply like the Chinese. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter is that I think we are really in a very, very serious and dangerous period. And as far as we're concerned in Israel, as you probably all know, we have been in a state of general mobilization now for over nine months. Uh, we've had little let-ups, let but our actual general mobilization has remained. And just last weekend, the whole country was put on again and alert. So you see, the, the thing is, we don't know when this is going, going to go up. It is very, very interesting that our intelligence service believes that for wholly internal reasons, the Syrians would like a short, sharp war with Israel in which certain gentlemen in the Syrian cabinet would like to take the opportunity of wiping out one or two other gentlemen in the Syrian cabinet and say that the Israelis did it. Now, that may seem absolutely crazy to you, but there is a power struggle going on within the Syrian cabinet, cabinet between Assad. You know, Assad's a, a, a dying man. He has a very serious heart problem, and there's no possibility that he will live. So it's just a question of time. And Rifat Assad is like Berea of, of Stalin's day. And uh, he is a hated man. If that man ever took over from Assad, then uh, we have a far more terrible uh, uh, way ahead. Uh, so uh, there are people in the cabinet who would very much like to see him um, out of the way. And the best way would be a short, sharp war in which quite a lot of things could be done. And of course, it would be Israeli action that did it all. Um, now, that it may seem terribly odd to all of you, but that's how things happen in our part of the world. Um, what can we say about all of this? Does it depress you? I hope it doesn't. I hope you look on the more, um, the more uh, 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 glorious and comforting side. These are milestones. It's rather like the Lord said, Though I, in the psalm, inspired the psalmist to say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, first of all, there can be no shadow without light. Secondly, he didn't say, though I stay in the valley of the shadow of death. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Every step takes you through it. These are milestones. We passed them. We have a way to go. How much further we have to go, we don't know. But it's incumbent upon us as the people of God to be ready. Full of the Spirit. Anointed by the Spirit. In touch with the Lord. Hearing the Lord. Alive to the things of God. Functioning as members of the body of Christ. Alive to one another. In fellowship with one another. Moving together. How we need the Lord in these days and how cleverly the enemy is working all the time one way or another to destroy all these uh, 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 these qualities amongst the people of God dear friends Jesus said when you see these <coughs> things begin to come to pass look up lift up your heads your redemption draweth nigh it is a wonderful word the Jewish posture of worship is to stand with head up and worship the Lord. The Christian is, on the whole, a bowed head. And there's nothing wrong with that either, I, I don't think, as long as it's not that melancholic graveyard type uh, thing. But, I mean, the Christian thing has always been to bow one's head with hands folded and down. And the, Christian one is, uh, the Jewish one is to lift up your hands and stand. When Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up lift up your head. What he was really saying was this. When you see these things begin to come to pass, don't be depressed. Don't be panic-stricken. Don't succumb. Worship. Because I told you all these things because I have an objective. Your redemption is drawing near. And this worship isn't a form of escapism. A kind of Christian jamboree where we can shut out the wicked world around us and just have a lovely time forget them all it is very often a declaration of truth where together we proclaim together in worship that he is king he is lord we belong to him 
We're on the winning side. We are those who've been saved out of this world. And not just that, but the Lord has a purpose for this world. You see, there are those who tell me, and I must finish, I'm sure you've been very good to listen for so long. But you see, the thing is, that there are those who tell us the Lord's purpose is only the church. I've said it for years, years and years. Some of you know, we've been like a, 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 a kind of one way sort of thing on this matter. I mean, it's the church, it's the church, it's the church. So when they tell me, oh, you've gone off the rails, you see. So you've gone off the rails. You, you, you've left all this. The, the whole point is this. It's absolutely true that God's purpose is centred in the church. But that doesn't mean that there's not a destiny for the Jewish people. The church is actually Jewish. And all the Gentiles are there, not as second-class citizens. They have been grafted in as full citizens, full partakers of the commonwealth of Israel. But that doesn't make it any less Jewish. Just because there are multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of, the, of, of believers of Gentile extraction doesn't do anything to the Jewishness in the eyes of the Lord, of the church. And the last phase is to bring in all the natural branches back into their own olive tree. Now, if that is true, my dear friends, there's something even more exciting. I don't know what it is. You know, I, when I was first saved, we used to believe that the, all our salvation was for our spirit. Nothing for soul, nothing for body. Bit by bit, the Lord did broaden down outlook to realize that our salvation includes spirit, soul, and body. I don't believe in a salvation that only has something to do with my spirit. And every time something happens in my body, I can't do anything about it. What kind of salvation is that? It was better even under the old covenant when the Lord said, I am your healer. <laughs> I am the Lord that healeth thee. And none of these afflictions that come upon the Egyptians shall come upon you. I mean, if it's so true, I mean, we have a wonderful law. But I want to say just something else in connection with that, and it's this. God has a purpose for this earth. I don't know what it is about this Greek idea, that this Hellenistic idea that somehow got into Christianity, that God is not interested in our body and not interested in the earth. The body and the earth are evil. The heavens and the spirit are pure. I want to tell you that Satan has been up in the heavens for some thousands of years. <laughs> And only at the end will he come down on the earth. You see, it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. God, do you know I don't believe God made this earth and saw it was good and then saw man make a mess of it and sin come in and Satan come in and God says, oh, well, poor, it's a mess. Anyway, we'll get them through it. And when we've saved them, we'll float them away into some kind of heavenly ether. <laughs> and there they will strum hearts in sort of transparent nighties <laughs> forever and ever and ever and ever. It's a kind of idea. It's nonsense. The purpose of God is a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And the old, as the old <coughs> ideal of the prophet was the lamb shall lie down with the lion and the bear with the, they'll all eat straw like the ox and the child will play with the viper and I can't wait for it myself <laughs> just absolutely can't wait for it and the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea that to me is absolutely marvellous so I believe that little Israel is the symbol that God intends to, re to, to redeem the earth it's had its baptism of water. It will await its baptism of fire. But it will come out of it a new heaven and a new earth. I don't know when or how. Whether it's before the millennium, after the millennium, whether there is even a millennium. I mean, all I know is that somehow or other, God's going to do this marvelous work. And Israel is the sign that God ha is not just trapped within some church that is perfect. He knows all the cities of the world and he has a purpose for the nations. And this fulfillment of his word concerning Israel has something to do with that master plan. May God 
help you to be ready, help you to be functioning members of the fellowship that you're in, wherever it is, and help you uh, to be real intercessors in the days that lie ahead. May he come upon you by his spirit with that object in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lance. I almost wanted to say two things. One was that I will not wear a transparent nighty. <laughs> <laughs> and the other, when Lance said he couldn't wait for it, I thought if he goes on much longer, we'll almost be there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can I throw in just one practical thing? I find when listening to things like this, I find it is very moving. I, I don't know, perhaps I speak for many. Um, just as the Lord over the years has begun to show us, because Lance has spoken to the company here uh, quite a number of times about these things, I've always found it very moving to think of all that the Jewish people have gone through, and I didn't even know about it. All the things. Have you ever looked back on your life like that and thought, that was happening then. That, and I didn't even know uh, that was happening. And I find that uh, very moving. And I think God wants us to be moved. But <clears throat> always, if we are really moved, it spurs us to action. Uh, God forbid that we should be the kind of people that like coming to a meeting to be moved. Uh, real moving things stirrings within us always produce action at least that's what god's word tells us and uh, i'm sure there are practical things we can do to be involved in what god is doing with the jewish people i just want to say that very simply there are in this area uh prayer groups there are little groups called intercessors <coughs> Uh, for Israel. Paul, do you, do you want to say something at this point? Well, there are three groups, I think, all here. Um, just, do you like yeah. to stand up, Janet? Just so anybody living in the East Twickenham area uh, could see Janet afterwards, if they'd like to join in a prayer group for Israel. If anybody lives in the Richmond area, they're welcome to come and see me. I'll tell you where it is, more than happily. And uh, there's oh, somebody from the Turk from the Twickenham Witten End. Roy's in the studio. Oh, Roy's there. Thank you, Roy. I didn't yeah. know if you were still trapped with those headphones. <coughs> if you're living in the, the central Twickenham and Whitten area and you'd like to join a prayer group, please see Roy. He's there at the back of the room. <coughs> Thank you. So that's just one <coughs> simple way in which you can seek to be uh, linked up um, and involved. In a sense, these groups don't belong to any particular uh, fellowship as such. They, they are a <coughs> cross-grouping uh, of folk from, from different fellowships, those that the Lord has given a real burden uh, for Israel. So that's one way in which we can be uh, more fully <coughs> involved. Thank you, Lance. I, Thank I you. feel it was good that we were focused again, uh, not only on the, the basis uh, for why God has a future for Israel, but just brought right up to date uh, on some of the big issues that are mm. facing us all. Uh, now, let's sing a hymn as we close. I think it'd be good to <coughs> praise the Lord. It's number two.
into that olive tree. And we praise you too, Lord, for those that are the basis, are the foundation of that tree, the roots, as it were, the stock of that tree. And Lord, we want to thank you for that word. It says, then shall all Israel be saved. Lord, what a marvellous day you're bringing in when the whole family of faith, the whole yes, family of God, shall be gathered together into one. Lord, Amen. we just worship before you. And Lord, as you've stirred our thoughts to think about your people Israel, we, Lord, we just want to pray for them right now. Lord, you know the tremendous issues that they have to face. You know all that's happening with Iraq and Iran and so on. Lord, we want to pray that you will do a real work of preparation. Lord, we believe you've got those people in that land that really means something to you in these days. And we want to pray that you'll go on preparing your people yes, uh, for all the pressure that's yet to come. And Lord, we remember the folk in uh, Russia, Lord. We are standing with you that you will bring them out with a, a mighty hand. Lord, we, we trust you. You already made preparation. Lord, we... Pray when the moment is right that you will bring them forth, you'll release them. Mm. So, Lord, keep us faithful as we think of these things, faithful in prayer and expectation. And, Lord, even here in the area where we live, where there are Jewish folk, when in any way, Lord, we can befriend them or love them or show them Christ, we pray that you'll help us to do it. Amen. Commit Lance to you, Lord, as he goes on to the states and all that lies ahead there. Think of the family conference and so on. Lord, do be with him and lead him in ways to show forth your glory. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May you be prepared for the redemption which is soon to come. May your eyes be fixed on the one who redeems. May you know the deep, deep love of Jesus.